big enough with our next session that is the topic is strategies for international companies to deal with intellect intellectual property disputes we have our speakers joining in q yayo jong she's a le associate legal officer world intellectual property organization we have kenneth zayo head of legal and compliance from sig combi block we have ben juan chen partner from selink law due to some reason sean leong is unable to join for the session so i would request everyone to start up with the discussion and take it from here thank you thank you okay and uh, uh, good afternoon and everyone and uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, such an uh, important topic. And I'm Kenneth Zhou, I'm the head of legal compliance for SIG Comic Block. Just I introduce myself in the morning, and I'm in charge of uh, both legal and compliance and IP management for my current company. Uh, I have worked for many uh, multinational companies like Lucent, Arctel, IKEA, Tejubac, and the current company, SIG Comic Block. So I can share some uh, tips for my experience to dealing with the international property disputes. Uh, the first tip I want to show to you is that uh, as uh, the IP chief uh, IP counsel or the legal guys, you have to clear your company's strategy, whether you want to choose the defensive strategy or the offensive strategy. Defensive means that creating, uh, generating a defensive position against competitor and uh, marketplace to have stable IP position against the extra stress. And offensive means that you can creating the offensive IP position just against the specific markets or competitor. You can see that the word is just uh, one word. Uh, it's different is that uh, one is targeted to a specific target, means that uh, you may target to your competitor and you will show very ag aggressive. Uh, I can show my personal experience. When I worked for my first employer 20 years ago, the Chinese company's name is Hire. Hire Group is a very famous Chinese company. And 20 years ago, when Hire when to entry the international market like uh, American and Arab was, and the higher face some stress, and also higher face the IP disputes. The dispute was uh, uh, threatened by higher's Germany partner, Libo Higher, and Libo Higher and Higher they are uh, they have the harmony period and they work closely and they just uh, uh, to create and sell the product in Chinese market. But then when higher went to entry the European market, Libra higher, higher European partner find that that's the strategy. So Libra higher, they shoot the def uh, offensive strategy. And Libra higher threatened that higher uh, breach the contract uh, liability and uh, infringe the patent and uh, infringe the law how because they sign the cooperation agreement. It's the international disputes and the dispute will be will be solved by the Swedish uh, arbitration commission. I, I uh, due to the limited time, I don't want to spend more time to introduce the case, but I want to tell you that because. Uh, your company has a different culture and your company has a different position, you may choose either defensive or offensive. I can also show the example two. Example two is also between one Chinese company and uh, one multinational company. The Chinese com company's name is, uh, is uh, Great View, is uh, the competitor of uh, my current company. And then the other multinational company is Tejupai, is also my former employer. Great View choose the offensive strategy, and the Great View manage Tejupai's pattern uh, closely. And also, Great View filed the many patent application regularly, yearly. And also, Great View filed the patent infringement application in the 
Germany caught. So you can see that grid view shows very aggressive uh, angle. Why grid view choose offensive uh, strategy? The one of the reasons is that the former CEO and the former founder, um, uh, uh, sorry, is not the former, is the current uh, the CEO and the, the main management of grid view come from Touchpad. They may face uh, unfair treatment or they may feel unhappy when they work in Touchpad. So the anger, they uh, dominate uh, their, 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 their head, so it influences uh, their decisions and strategy. So it can let grid view to shoot very aggressive to catch a pack. And also I can show you the other signs that the, uh, the result is quite obvious. Grid view win the case, the patent case in Germany. And then grid view can show the winning result to the Chinese customer, Chinese consumer. It can win the market share. So different uh, strategy uh, for your company to choose can, uh, can influence the, the decision. The tip two is that uh, you have to think, not have to. I would suggest that you should think like CEO. I know that most of the audience are either come from uh, IP experts or come from the legal background. You may focus on whether the, uh, the technology uh, falling into our patent claim uh, scope, or whether you use the same or similar trademark, or whether you just uh, uh, use uh, the, the same or similar design. But I would suggest you should think like a business guy, especially you should think like the CEO. They are the decision maker. So you have to think what they are thinking. You have to uh, think how to persuade them to file the lawsuit, the IP lawsuit. And uh, I can show the experience because I, I, I am lucky that I handle the, the, the IP uh, management uh, in my current company. So I have the opportunity to have the deep dialogue with the top management in our company. So I know that they may do not care about the conversation. They care more about what's the benefit. The benefit could be millions of dollars of a conversation, but they care more about whether they can just block our competitor to entry the new market or entry to the new product, or whether the competitor they can easily to design around. So if they know that oh, it can uh, help them to achieve some the business purpose, then it will be perfect. So uh, this is my second tip uh, sharing to you. And also the other uh, important consideration for the business guys, they may think about the domino effect or incident effect. Uh, I can show you an example. The foreign guys, they may care about whether the Chinese competitor or the Chinese company, they may lobby to the local government. And uh, I can show you the other example is that the touchback was felt by huge fines because of Tetrapack breach the anti monopoly law. It's the lobby work by the Chinese competitor with you. Okay, the tip three is that you may choose your uh, IP lawsuit strategy according to the different IP types. Uh, for trademark and design infringement, you may choose to send the cease and desist letter directly. It will be, uh, help you to save the cost. Because the, uh, as all of you know that the litigation will consume uh, a lot of time and consume a lot of the money. So send the cease and desist letter can help you to stop infringement uh, quickly. And I, I know that uh, one of our speakers come for, works for Alibaba. Uh, I went to send the attorney letter to Alibaba to stop the infringement <laughs> online. And also for uh, handling the counterfeit product, you may involve the uh, customs. Or you may involve some what we call the SAIC official to help you to confiscate the counterfeit product. It also can save your time. And for the trade secret disputes, it's very difficult to collect uh, evidence. So uh, I know that a few companies they may choose to resort to the criminal channel 
and involve the policeman to help them find the evidence. So the easy way to handle the uh, uh, trade secret is sign long computer agreement with the key person and strengthen the confidential protection protection program to protect your company's confidential information. For patent, it's very complex, complex and uh, because we do not have too much time to <laughs> introduce it, so I just give you tips that you may focus on your key product. You may focus on the uh, technology or product, your product, which is the next generation. And, but for some uh, uh, product which is can easily design around all the keys, it's difficult to collect evidence to against uh, your target company then you may consider it carefully. Okay, that's all for my part. Thank you. Okay, great. So, um, so thank you all. It's indeed a great honor to meet you all here at this event and also a good opportunity to share with you some ideas on this specific topic. So actually, I personally find that, uh, well, this is a very interesting topic. Uh, even though I think um, maybe I should be, you know, like speaking after Kathy and Wenxuan, who are usually uh, from the opinions of the real parties who get involved in dispute. But um, I think it's still a good time to to start to um, bring some new ideas to you. So we know that, well, for companies, uh, dispute is somehow uh, inevitable during the business. Um, and whenever a specific dispute arises, uh, parties like how to choose the most efficient and effective uh, dispute resolution mechanisms to resolve a specific dispute would be one of the most important decisions a company need to make. Um, however, uh, we know that usually uh, parties, uh, companies who are trying to uh, think about court litigation as a preferred method um, or even the default method, but for international IP and technology disputes. So especially, for example, where the disputes might involve parties from more than two or even three countries around the world. And also it is involving to, you know, like uh, specialized technology issues and also sometimes involving trade secret, as Kathleen just mentioned, and also sometimes some uh, sensitive technology information party doesn't want to disclose to the public uh, through the published judgment. So whether there's other dispute resolution mechanisms uh, companies may think about to select uh, for specific this type of dispute. So this is the main topic I'm going to discuss with you. Um, so first of all, I would like to share with you some other dispute resolution mechanisms besides court litigation, which has been widely used around the world by parties, uh, especially for uh, for IP related disputes. So for ADR, actually the, it stands for alternative dispute resolution. So it's dispute resolution mechanisms, alternative to court litigation. So usually it uh, includes, for example, mediation, arbitration, and expert determination. So the, these three types of mechanism has a main difference uh, with uh, court litigation. Uh, which is that those three proceedings are consensual, which means that only both parties of a dispute agree to submit their dispute for ADR dispute resolution mechanisms, for example, for mediation or for arbitration or for expedite, expert determination, and then such proceedings can initiate. So this is totally different from court litigations where one party can go straight forward to initiate uh, the proceedings. So for mediations, it's a more informal and flexible process where uh, there is a mediator who is neutral and a third party from both sides. And they, uh, the mediator helps parties to reach a settlement agreement, but, they can, uh, but the mediator cannot impose a decision to the parties. So usually if the parties assigned a settlement agreement throughout the mediation session, uh, the settlement agreement would be infected as a contract. Um, of course, this may change uh, a lot after the signature of the, uh, sorry, after the effectiveness of the Singapore Convention. Um, but we have limited time, so I will leave it to uh, maybe future discussions. Um, and for arbitrations, uh, also again, consensual procedurals, which means parties need to agree to submit their dispute to arbitrate. But um, 
it is different from mediation in the sense that it is more formal. It's a formal legal proceedings. So you can think it as a kind of like a private litigation proceedings. So there will be one or more than one uh, chosen arbitrators uh, to a consisting a uh, tribunal, and they will decide the legal issues and and resulting into a binding and final decisions. We usually call it as a word. And this final arbitral award can be enforced internationally. And this is something that different from a court judgment, which means that usually, for example, if we receive a judgment in uh, in Singapore, made by courts in Singapore. So uh, if we want to enforce the judgment into another jurisdiction, uh, this may be very difficult because of the uh, legal sovereignty. But for arbitration, because more than 160 countries in the world has joined in the New York Convention, so all those signature member states has the uh, international obligations to enforce international arbitration awards. So this would not be a problem for enforceability for the arbitral world. And for expert determination, this is more uh, uh, focused on specific matters. For example, if we have a specific IP related technology issue, or for example, in licensing contract, if we want to determine the loyalty or some specific issues, then we can uh, submit these issues to a specific selected neutral or expert to let him to make a decision. And the, this, this decision can be binding between the both parties, unless the parties have agreed otherwise. So this is the three ADR mechanisms we uh, usually see people, uh, parties would use uh, to resolving their disputes. So as Kathleen just mentioned, actually there are many considerations that a company would usually think about when they are selecting the most uh, efficient dispute resolution mechanisms to resolve the specific arising disputes, or even when they are drafting the clause of the contract and they are trying to uh, draft in the dispute resolution clause in a, for example, in a licensing contract or in a service contract, they would also think about which would be the most uh, useful or helpful uh, dispute, me uh, dispute resolution mechanism for my contacts. So according to an international survey of dispute resolution in technology transactions, WIPO Center did, um, the top two considerations uh, of parties are usually cost and time. And then besides that, for example, whether the result could be enforced in different countries, and also whether the outcome is uh, in high quality or done by you know, someone with professional knowledge, especially related to patent or technology uh, issues, um, and also whether uh, the proceedings are confidential, whether the, uh, the decisions are confidential. This is also very important to uh, IP disputes and also for some big companies. And again, whether the business relationship could be maintained. So for the top two consideration, time and cost, uh, we find that specifically for IP dispute resolution, um, the court, we find that actually mediation is usually the most time and cost efficient one where parties could resolve their dispute in a relatively short time and in relatively low cost. And besides, uh, and about that would be expedited arbitration and arbitration. And in the end of the spectrum would be the uh, foreign uh, litigation in foreign jurisdictions that would usually be very costly, no matter for the money side or for the time side. So actually, we are, uh, the reason why I'm introducing like different uh, dispute resolution mechanisms to you is not saying that uh, please use ADR for all disputes. Uh, that is not my purpose. It is actually I want to share with um, our colleagues at different companies to know that like whenever you are facing a dispute, especially international IP dispute, you may think about like which would be the most uh, efficient way and which is the most uh, important considerations for you in a specific situation and concerning a specific dispute. So for example, different uh, mechanisms would have their own uh, characters. So for example, whether parties need to agree to, be, uh, to initiate proceedings or whether parties could select the person who make the decisions and to shape the proceedings and also whether these proceedings and result would be confidential, um, and also uh, whether the result could be internationally enforced. 
So trying to make a smart decisions after taking all those elements or considerations uh, into mind. So in what position I'm sharing this to you is because I'm, I'm from the WIPO Arbitration and Mediation Center. Uh, so we basically we receiving arbitration and mediation cases uh, for uh, especially involving those international IP disputes uh, every year and around the world. So you most of you might know hear about like what WIPO is. So WIPO, as you know, is a, is a special agency of uh, WIPO. But WIPO Arbitration and Mediation Center is a, is a specific department of WIPO. So basically, we are facilitating parties to uh, resolve their commercial disputes and especially for their IP and technology disputes. So um, as Kathleen just mentioned, sometimes uh, from the company side, when they're thinking about uh, resolving international IP disputes, they might have one concern is about uh, whether it will be neutral, whether, whether there will be any bias uh, because of the court, because of the sovereignty. So for WIPO, it's very good that we are international neutral and different from other uh, arbitration and mediation institutes around the world, we are more specialized in IP and technology disputes. This is basically benefiting from the strong IP background of WIPO and we keep a, a large database on IP experts currently consisting more than 2,000 IP experts from more than 100 countries, so where parties can freely choose their mediators, arbitrators, or experts uh, from the database. And another thing is WIPO services are not for profit, so our fees and costs in WIPO proceedings are uh, very compatible uh, to other institutions. Mm. So we actually can see that ADR right now has been widely used for parties all, all over around the world in resolving IP disputes. So from WIPO's experiences, um, actually most of the cases from WIPO are uh, from Europe and North America. But in the past two years, we see a rapid increase in Asia that parties are trying to use an ADR to resolving their IP dispute. And uh, in WIPO cases, the legal areas basically cover all the IP cases. So no matter it's patent disputes, trademark disputes, specifically for ICT disputes, for example, uh, licensing or even SEP disputes um, can also be resolved through ADR. And of course, copyright and other commercial disputes. Um, and the reason why actually we are, we are encouraging companies to think about mediation and arbitration is, is because we see that, um, for example, in WIPO mediation proceedings, 70% of the cases, um, parties reached a settlement agreement. So which means that when doing ADR, uh, parties compared to them in a legal proceedings, they're usually more open or more willing to, uh, to negotiate with the, the other side and perhaps resulting in a very good result. Sometimes, for example, even though it's an infringement dispute, but it's ending into a licensing agreement. And this kind of like a creative resolution uh, arrangement may never be seen in a court litigation. Um, so I know the time is very limited. So uh, I think maybe I will leave it to here. And then let's see if we have time. I would like to share perhaps some like case examples if there's an interested audience uh, to you. So I'll stop from here and leave the time back to Wenxian. Thank you. Well, this is my first time to be on a virtual conference. I think this is a new trend and it's quite a great experience of learning. Well, um, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, first of all, I introduce myself. Well, I used to be a presiding judge of Intellectual Property Tribunal of Beijing, the first intermediate people's court. And I used to serve as a leading counsel of non-standard dispute resolution team, as well as IPR protection team of Alibaba Group. Now I'm a, a founding partner uh, with stating law. Um, my firm is a PRC focused on key law. We mainly do three things. First one is intellectual property litigation. 
trains enter enterprise communication, and the third one is digital uh, economy compliance. Um, today's topic is about international uh, mitigations. Um, based on my experience, I will share my some thoughts of um, pattern mitigation strategy in People's Republic of China. Um, you know, these days, um, China becomes strategically important for international companies um, outside of China. I think the reason for that, uh, there are two reasons. First one, China become one of the biggest market for end consumers, uh, for, for end consumers products. And second, China become one of the largest manufacturing base for makers. So under Chinese law, Chinese courts and regulators have jurisdiction, jurisdiction over any energy goods sold to Chinese markets and made in China. I will give you two examples. The first one is, let's suppose that A, a foreign company sells products via a completely foreign platforms, uh, for example, like Tmall International uh, to consumer in China. If there is any IPR infringement, IPR holder can sue A in Chinese court. Another example is that if a foreign company, A, assign a Chinese local uh, brand to OME its product, even though all products are outbound and shipped outside of the China, I hope you can sue A for infringing a manufacturing auto not a single item out in China, and there's no energy in China. So these two examples show that why China become um, very top, very hot choice for those companies to file litigations. Key takeaways, firstly, if you are an international company, ask yourself a question first. Will you sell your product? Uh, I just uh, heard about uh, Qin Yao's introduction and I think that uh, WIPO's uh, ADR channel is the good channel because I know that a lot of the foreign companies, they care more about uh, how to keep confidential for their technology. They have a lot of concerns on the Chinese court and I have the concerns on the Chinese bureau. They care about whether the officials, they will uh, just uh, ask uh, the foreign companies to provide the, 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 the technology copies and know that some there's the requirement for the court. They have to keep some evidence. So I think that for Wipers ADR is very good channel. But uh, frank speaking, I never tried it. <laughs> so do you have something to add, Kiyo? Thank you, Kinan. Uh, yeah, I think this is also well the reason why actually whenever the disputes are international, um, well actually also even for Chinese parties, sometimes if they go outside for litigation, they may also have concern that is quite normal. So ADR is more like a neutral platform for everyone to kind of like finding a place where they trust and also they find professionalism inside. Um, and actually because I, yeah, because I saw there's a Q&A session popping up and there's a very, okay, maybe we will leave it when she is here. Uh, yeah. ADI is very important. Um, uh, my focus is still on the traditional litigation. And um, like I say, key ways, I think um, the key takeaways, firstly, uh, for international uh, company, ask yourself first if you, uh, as you uh, will you sell your product to China or will you manufacture your product in China? And second, um, consider that if your main competitor uh, uh, to China or will your main competitor do make its uh, product in China? Third, if there is any copycat 
happening in China, uh, if the answer is either of the above, please consider uh, Chinese pattern law. Uh, important uh, because nowadays, why many international companies choose China to be an ideal place to uh, file litigation? Uh, for example, in terms of the uh, defendant's perspective, uh, China, Chinese court is a uh, ideal foreign. It's kind. It's kind of uh, international foreign shopping uh, because Chinese court is efficient uh, and the timeline is relatively uh, short uh, compared to uh, litigation in U.S. So it's a very good idea to counter attacks in China. For example, there are four uh, levels in China and uh, since 2019, all the second instance, uh, well, I, 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 I need to uh, explain a little bit. In China, pattern infringement litigation will go through two instances. Uh, the first instance is, is heard by the intermediate people's court level and the second instance instance since 2019 it's been heard by supreme court directly so it means that um previously there were more than 30 provincial high people court to hear the second instances but after that there are only single court which is the supreme court in just, uh, this type of system was very well since it was more um, consistency and predictability uh, for this. So um, we, because half of our clients are you know, companies outside of uh, China, and uh, many of them why they choose uh, Chinese courts uh, is to counter Contact their computer. For example, if a company uh, is sued by a computer in FT, okay, I think that uh, if it's some uh, technical problem, uh, due to the time limit, I would suggest that maybe we can just jump to the Q and A. Sure. So we have a question in the minute. So we, if we can take the question in the meanwhile. Yeah, I see it. And uh, does the online mediation arbitration work effectively? Um, I don't know, maybe Qing Yao, I don't know whether you had any online mediation arbitration because yes, due actually, to the COVID-19. Yeah, so actually we are uh, having more and more proceedings conducted online since 2020 since the pandemic and uh, uh, online mediation and arbitration becomes even right now the default method for mediation and arbitration and many institutions including the WIPO Arbitration Mediation Center we basically amended our rules to allow parties to choose uh, online mediation and arbitration as, as a way and to facilitate that we have uh, in kind of like design or established a uh, online platform to achieve those kind of proceedings. Uh, what are the problems we have encountered? Well, I think the problem is that, well, you know, when people are negotiating face to face, this is something that we usually be more used to, and it's even more easy to get the, you know, like the emotional contact. But like whenever it's becoming like um, machines to machines, that may change a little bit. But I believe that now we are much more used to, you know, like negotiating and discussion over online uh, facilities, especially in the past two years. So I think these differences may become, you know, like uh, smaller in the future. And online mediation and arbitration, the best thing for that is that we can save a lot of costs for travel for both the parties and also the neutrals. So this is also a good advantages for it. Okay. Yeah, I fully agree with you. And I think uh, due to the COVID-19, I think currently the online mediation arbitration is the channel we have to use it. Otherwise, uh, if for some international disputes, 
uh, due to similar restrictions by the different countries. You cannot go to the foreign countries to uh, attend the, uh, the hearing. So we have to uh, try the online thing. But the other thing is that uh, I agree with you that uh, how to uh, negotiate and how to just uh, show evidence, show opinion uh, on online is also a like, very challenging thing. Usually, I know that uh, when people they talk uh, with, uh, in the machine and they may consider something and they have they may change some uh, the, the attitude, so it's different. Yes, indeed. I don't know whether any other questions. So, in the meanwhile, Kenneth and Kiyo, if you would like to conclude the session in one line, what would it be? Okay, Yao, maybe you're first. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Uh, if in one line is that, well, uh, there is no best strategies for IP internet, international IP dispute resolution, uh, but there is the most efficient way to resolve the specific IP dispute. So maybe this is something that companies may think about in specific contexts. Okay, uh, for my, uh, if I uh, give one word for the strategy how to handle uh, international IP disputes is that less litigation. And because of the company, you have to cost a lot of money and uh, the, the manpower to do it. So you may spend more time to think about how to uh, create more pattern and how to draft better for your claim scope. Litigation in China is uh, very consuming. All right. So, Benjamin, can you continue? Can you hear us? Oh, yeah. I think you, uh, we were very near the end of this section. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry I can't do my presentation, but uh, uh, what I want to share with the last few words is that um, please consider, please expect your competitor's uh, reaction if you file lawsuits no matter in which country and uh, uh, you can also consider if there is any link uh, between your competitor and Chinese market uh, if there is you can consider uh, litigations or other administrative proceedings in China uh, no matter it's your active attack to your competitor or your counter attack to react to your competitors first attacked in other countries. Uh, so there are multiple tools for patentee uh, to um, deal with in uh, China. And nowadays uh, with the new uh, court system, uh, I mean since 2019, the Supreme Court, uh, the single court would hear the uh, whole, hear the uh, order can instance litigations, patent litigations, and with the new law, patent law of 2020, which introduced punitive, uh, punitive uh, damages for the plaintiffs. Um, so uh, China uh, litigation in China become more and more attractive for international companies. Uh, I think in the future, this, is, this has to be a chance that um, Chinese that uh, type of uh, international shopping. Um, so um, China will become a marketplace for international shopping. Sorry, Wenxian, we cannot hear you well. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Uh, let's, let, let's finish here and we can join you next, next time. Thank you very much. So uh, if you can just uh, conclude the session, Mansuran, we all we have three more minutes for you. So you can, you know, uh, discuss it. Mm -hmm. So uh, over to you. If your network connection is clear, we can have the concluding points from you. Oh, it's OK. Uh, because I, I have already uh, shared some conclusions, but uh, because the, due to the network, uh, you can't hear well from me. Uh, okay, so let's come here. Uh, maybe next time I can join you uh, for further discussion. Thank you very much. 
So it has been a very interesting topic, Zia, uh, Kiyo and Kenneth and Venturan. So having your inputs about this insightful topic, it has been great. And just understanding the strategies which every international company should, you know, employ to deal with the IP dispute. So, uh, so good to have your points and good to understand it more closely. And uh, when she wants, so we can have your concluding points on the chat box so that we can read it out for you or Kenneth or Kyo can read it out for you. So if you can mention those points on the chat box and your concluding points, like four to five points you can mention, which we can, you know, uh, highlight it to the audience. And any more points you would like to add in, Kyo and Kenneth? Anything, any takeaway points? Um, I think one point from my side would be that for, for companies, um, sometimes it will not be too early for us to think about, uh, carefully think about this new resolution when we are drafting a contract, because there's a very important clause in the contract, which is the dispute resolution clause. So uh, sometimes companies may, may just, you know, like take it for granted saying that we will never go to a dispute unless a real dispute arises. But in that time, consensual uh, proceedings may, very be, will, may be very hard because no agreement usually would be a, a reached during that period. So trying to think about in advance when drafting contract, when uh, doing licensing, All right, Kenneth, do you have anything more? Um, no. <laughs> okay, all right, sure. So, uh, Kyo, Kenneth, and Ben Shuan, so good to have you for this wonderful session. And to all the participants who joined in for, you know, and given their uh, thoughts about it and also understanding about this topic closely. All right, thank you so much, Ben Shuan, Kenneth, and Ziao. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye from me. Bye bye. Thank you, all.